Hello and thank you for tuning in. My name is Mark Lesnick and I'm a researcher and a PhD student here at Ulm University. And today I would like to talk to you about uh, the research we've done on multivariate time series synthesis using generative adversarial networks together with my colleagues here in Ulm University, Patrick Michalski, Benjamin Schanzel and Jörg Domaschka, and also our colleague from BT, Peter Willis, and Per Olaf Ösberg from the Ulmer University. So, without further ado, let us dive in. So essentially, we'll start with a quick motivation of why generally synthetic data or data synth synthetization is meaningful, valuable. Well, first of all, the proliferation of database solutions and applications is not going away anytime soon. And by that, I basically mean not only all the machine learning research that is being performed that is, of course, very, very dependent on the data, synth not only data synthesis, but the data availability as it is, but a lot of monitoring and profiling applications, which are, of course, also performed using swaths and swaths of data. And the AI data market is being projected to be worth around 5 billion by 2027. And to be clear here, we're not talking about the machine learning applications or the AI applications in this case. We're simply talking about the uh, value of the data itself with, of course, synthetic data being a major driver in this, uh, in this specific scenario. Um, synthetic data is specifically very, very incredibly valuable for around the cloud profiling, benchmarking, load balancing and provisioning research and researchers um, tend to rely on that uh, not only for first evaluations of toy data sets but also um, there are several specific key advantages which I would like to talk about. The increase in general availability and accessibility of the data can be uh, done using synthetic data because specifically it can be used to avoid data privacy restrictions, for example, the GDPR, and also simultaneously increase use of privacy, of course. So by synthesizing data based on, or in this case, we will be also obfuscating some, some kind of uh, private data that a company might not be willing to share. But using a synthetic data application, the same data can then be shared with the research community, for example, and of course, increase the value for again, cloud profiling, benchmarking, and other research activities. Also, again, what if analysis can be uh, also performed with the data? So if we would uh, look at a data set and would like to see how a specific application would perform under a, a, a bit different scenario, we can do that using synthetic data. Misfitting data problems can also be solved with that. So again, if we would look at, this is basically a, a, a type of what if analysis scenario, but if we would like to see a anomalies injected into our data, right? So if we're looking at some kind of a uh, load balancing applications and we have scenarios in mind, but we don't have them in the data, we could then augment the data set using those scenarios using a synthetic, synthetic data application, right? We can also solve problems of class representation and class misbalancing. So if we look, if we have several applications, but uh, the specific application that is of interest for us is not represented well enough in the data. We can then use synthetic data to augment uh, this specific class and allow for more data to be used uh, and more, of course, generalization to be performed throughout a machine learning cycle, for example. So just to, just to reiterate, um, we focus on multi multivariate time series data here. And just as a side note, the references correspond to, of course, the paper references, which you would find. So let's talk a bit about types of data synthesis because there are a lot of them the very easy ones are of course something like an extrapolation so we have some kind of data and we would uh, like to extrapolate in terms of how this data would look from a different time point and this uh, uh, the, the other part of it the interpolation so we have this is something that is of course being used incredibly uh, often in uh, in data analysis. So we have some kind of missing data, for example, missing timestamps or something like that. And we have to perform an interpolation, sometimes called also data imputation for that. We will also have some things like uh, the simulation. This is um, to some extent can be regarded as data synthesis because here we're basically talking about using observed workload to create a model Oftentimes, this is a model of some kind of a user interaction and then use that model to create more data and see uh, how an application would perform. This is often used in some kind of HTTP benchmarks and things like that. And um, in our case, we do not aim to simulate user behavior directly. 
but uh, we use we simulate or synthesize resource utilization metrics that result from input workloads and this is a differentiation that has to be made here and of course the one that we're actually using the generation using artificial neural networks and um, artificial the data generation using artificial neural networks and specifically in our case using generative adversarial neural networks is something that has gained incredible popularity in the recent uh, recent past so i think if uh, i ask you about generative adversarial neural networks or gans for short you might not know but you've definitely heard of the application of the dispersion not exist performing by carlos et al at nvidia so what they've done here is basically they've shown that a synthesis of human faces very plausibly and realistically looking human faces is possible using generative and uh, generative adversarial networks guns for short so the example here are countless they have been used in a time series domain including EKG data where uh, they were able to synthesize heartbeat uh, scenarios or financial data to also augment some kind of a financial application. So um, a big problem here and, and a very active uh, research field in, in those domains and not only in the time series synthesis domain but also in the image domain where several solutions have been proposed is the data validation specifically in the data in the time series in, in the i'm sorry image synthesis domain there have been some a very interesting solution called the, the fresh air score or the inception score to show that a data set might not be biased or represents more uh, the amount of classes that it should and this is a problem which we will come to later. So let's talk a bit about GANs in general, general for short. Um, GANs rely on real data, first of all. So if you look here, we start off with the real data, which we then sample and feed into a discriminator network. The discriminator network is what is the network that determines between real or fake data. So in this case, we would feed it the real data, so it, it learns to differentiate between the real and fake data. In the other part of it, we draw from a random noise distribution. This could be either a univariate or a normal distribution and feed it to a generator network. The gener generator network then learns to generate samples again of data and feed it to the discriminator network. And based on the feedback it receives from the discriminator network, it learns and of course betters itself to uh, gain this uh, probability here of a one. So basically it simply tries to fool the discriminator into thinking that the generated, generated data is real. So again, what we have here is the, the, the discriminator and the generator network uh, basically battling it out in a game of uh, min-max and trying to, uh, the, the one trying to get better at recognizing fake data from real data and the other trying to be becoming uh, better at creating fake data that is plausibly and realistically looking. How we have done it in our paper? Well, let's look at the workflow here before we talk a bit about the descriptive statistics of the generated data that we've used. So we start off by having a multivariate time series data. In this case, we pre-process it. We do the normalization of the data from zero to one because it's simply uh, better for the machine learning alg algorithms. You could optionally, we have opted out not to do this in this paper, but should you be forced, for example, with a, uh, with a very heterogeneous data set, you could optionally cluster your data, um, which would then lead to a homogeneous data classes. Then you could feed to the GAN network and produce the generated data. So similarly, as to have shown before, this, uh, this would be the process of the data generation where we feed it the homogeneous data that we have produced either to, through clustering or simply by obtaining homogeneous data. The generated data then of course needs to be validated. We use uh, two types of, of uh, two types of approaches to, to validate our, our data. First of all, we'll look at simple descriptive statistics. We'll look at the mean and the standard deviation of the data. Further, we use time series analysis to look at the, uh, time, the time series that we generate. So we look at the correlations between the, the different dimensions, the multivariate dimensions of our data. We we'll look at the data entropy, we we'll look at the approximate entropy, which um, not only tells us, uh, as in case of the entropy, about the noisiness, basically, or the information of the data, but also about the predictability of the data itself. And also we we'll look at the contiguration value of the data. So basically, if the contiguration is calculated between two time series, it looks at the long-term dependency of the data and, and tries to um, predict if the data is moving in the same direction. So um, what data did we use to do that? So this is a, a large part of our paper. We have uh, managed to open source 
uh, a lot of data from, from the uh, BT network. So specifically, it's a content delivery network data uh, from three inner core nodes of the BT network sampled at 20 minute intervals during the years 2016 and 2017, several months. This is around, uh, we have around three uh, months of data in that time. And it amounts to around uh, 20,000 points uh, for, for uh, three dimensions. Um, the timestamps, unfortunately, are omitted, as well as the relative measure, uh, the measurements of the load. So we're looking at relative load measurements, ranging from zero to one. But it's still a, a very, a very um, valuable data set when predicting cache hits and and cache misses in a content delivery networks, and trying to, of course, predict uh, the the load that will be uh, occurring on the network. Additionally, which what was not released, but we added into our evaluations was the incoming and outgoing traffic on those nodes. And it was simply done to synthesize more data and measure the correlations between the incoming outgoing traffic and also the content delivery hits. So what we've then done is we've generated 100 instances of three dimensional data points ranging to at around, at around 5,000 data points for each dimension. So all in all 15,000 data points for each instance. And we've done that 100 times using the network. So uh, in sum, we've generated about one and a half million data points. And um, I will spare you the tables here for, for, for time, uh, just simply to save time. You can definitely look at them in the paper. Um, but what, what, what can be seen here is uh, that the increase, uh, there is a slight increase in the mean and the standard deviation and the entropy of the synthesized data. This can simply be attributed to the fact that we gen generate a lot more data than we actually have as, as a starting point. So a bit of noise is uh, simply coming in the data. However, the drop in approximate entropy shows that a better generalization of the data is performed. So the data is still very much uh, predictable in the sense that we can use uh, some kind of a forecasting algorithms on the data, right? And both co-integration tests that we perform on the data. So basically what we do here is we use um, the synthesized uh, uh, a time series from the original data and the time series from the synthesized data. We perform the co-integration tests of those and all of those tests are well under the, under the 0 0.5 um, p-value, which shows that uh, those those time series move together in the, in the same direction. Um, and for the correlation, what we've done is basically perform the correlation calculations between the, uh, the in the in the generated data and in the original data, in the ground truth data. So basically we correlate the outgoing and the incoming traffic measurements with the cache hits and see the correlations there and do the same thing for the generated data. And there we have strong, nearly identical positive correlations between the, the, the multivariate data that we, that we have. And a very uh, a small uh, practical scenario that we've also shown uh, how this data, can be, um, this data can be used is basically what we've done. We've trained a, a forecasting algorithm only using the synthetic data and then applied uh, the forecasting using the real data and, and applied the forecasting on the data. And what we've seen here uh, is basically a drop in the root mean square error. So what uh, you see in the in the uh, uh, the observed value me measurements here in blue and the uh, forecasted measurements here in orange. And what we have actually seen is that um, the the root mean square error drops when we're able to basically pre-train our forecasting algorithm using uh, the synthetic data and then basically first after that show it the real data. So it uh, basically benefits from the additional generalization of this. Um, also something that was added during the, the review process and which we are actually very grateful for because it gave us a lot of uh, perspective on that is the efficiency of, of the data. So what we've looked at is basically we've generated um, random data, 5,000 data points of uh, univariate and multivariate data points, not only for the CDN data, but also random data. And what we've shown here is the that this generation process is independent from the data complexity itself. So this can be integrated, for example, into some kind of a pipeline where a synthetic data is being performed on the regular and it does not depend on the type of data that, that is input. So uh, you can use it with uh, probably any domain invariant time series data actually. So as a summary, what we've shown is that artificial data generation is viable and feasible with homogeneous workloads. And the statistical properties of the data are reflected. Um, 
A practical application is also feasible, as I've just shown with the case of a forecasting algorithm. Um, but we would also like to stress out that you know the, the performance statistical comparisons do not state that the, those single peaks or uh, troughs in the data are realistic from the behavioral point of view of the data of the model, but uh, the ser or the services that cause those utilizations, we're simply learning the model distribution of the data that is being uh, logged through the utilization of the hardware. And this is important because uh, this is what actually uh, differs from differs from a simulation, for example. Uh, our next steps are, of course, evaluation with more data sets and ideally open sourcing even more data, uh, more time series characteristics me measurements, um, multi-class data sentences, as, as I mentioned before, things like imbalance classes or anomaly injections in the data itself, new architectures, for example, autoencoders, but you know, we'll see what the future brings. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions at the conference. Thank you.